foods during the day. And then of course at night, it goes back to just the residences in the various communities, but they're also responding to mutual aid calls to help some of the surrounding areas, including Copay. So Chief said, I can't do it. And also, by the way, I've had to ask for Suffolk police to escort us to go there to respond to the concerns. My members, and these are volunteers, remember, they're not, you know, they're volunteering. So my men and women don't feel safe going there. What the hell's going on there? So I drove by there that morning. I see there's a big white PVC fence around it. Any of you have been up there, you can take a ride up there if you go up to Walmart or Airport Plaza and you see it just looks kind of um, eerie. That's, it's like locked up. So she says, oh yeah, uh, we have a, a group called Halo Farmingdale in there. Who's Halo Farmingdale? This is another organization that does this around the county, around the state. And they were supposed to have security, they're supposed to do this, they're supposed to do that. And I said, well, clearly they're not because if the chief tells us that they've been there 52 times and 27 of the 52 calls are for overdoses, somebody's not doing what they're supposed to be doing at that facility. And his members are frightened, scared. Now look, these guys don't get frightened easy, right? The men and women who work in the volunteer fire service, I mean, we've been there with them with Sandy, with COVID, with all of these responses, they don't frighten easy. And the fact that he told us that really scared us because we said uh, to him, uh, you can't go there anymore. We're not gonna let you go there. So the way it works, if you're in Copay, you have a fire district, so you have elected commissioners and they tax you for the fire service that they provide from Copeg, they're responsible for it. In the case of East Farmingdale, we as the town board are their commissioners because we collect the money. It's, it's uh, what's called a um, service area. We contract with the department. So we're ultimately responsible for what happens there. We said, as your contractor, we're not gonna let you go there because we don't want people getting hurt. We don't want our volunteers, something bad happening to them. And we also wanna make sure that you provide service to everybody else in East Farmingdale who's paying for service, uh, fire or rescue service. So we told the commissioner at that time on the Zoom, we said, okay, I'm gonna declare a state of emergency. So if you hear that term, state of emergency, usually connected with snow stay off the roads we haven't had that right I better knock on wood so we had like six storms in March yeah yeah you'll all be cursing me out if you haven't already if you haven't already so you can do that on Facebook um, but uh, declare a state of emergency and then I said we're gonna have a special meeting on Friday afternoon and we're gonna have two resolutions before the town board they all agreed and the resolutions are gonna say, one, we're going to demand that you not proceed with the South Bay Motel. And why is that? And we said in, in, the, in the resolution, and I'll read it when we actually have the official meeting at 3.30, we said that we'll take any and all measures to stop the county from doing anything at the South Bay Motel, including legal options that we have to stop something like that um, so that would be on re with regard to the South Bay Motel now the South Bay Motel just to give you some numbers the South Bay Motel uh, they intended on um, there are 39 rooms there and they intended on putting uh, at least 55 to 60 people in the 39 rooms right which which just and I said on the call, I said, well, if, you know, my nephew, who is um, a math major from Binghamton, <laughs> could tell me that 55 to 60 doesn't equal 39. <laughs> and in fact, it's probably a violation of the fire code for occupancy, and you would be committing a violation that we'd have to then get into another fight about if you proceeded. The Farmingdale location um, has right now about 60 individuals in that. 
Um, and Dwayne Gregory asked the right question. He, he said, what is the need that the county has for housing these homeless individuals? What is the population? She said 204. So I said, if we add up what's in Farmingdale and we add up what you want to put at South Bay and Copay, that means that we're going to shoulder the burden for over half of Suffolk County's homeless population. Now look, I'm Catholic, I speak, he sometimes answers, and I know that we all have to be caring, compassionate, and um, in tune with what's happening with people who are in a bad way, mental health, addiction, lost their job, whatever it is. I get that, but I don't get putting 60 or 70 people in a place where they're allowed to continue all of the things that brought them there uh, and either kill themselves, kill others, or harm the surrounding community. So I said, you have to explain to me, how am I supposed to like process that and take that back to residents who I have to talk to about that because you're not doing your job. In fact, you're, you're making it worse by putting them all together. And you know, I used to be on the county legislature way back when, where we had hearings and we said, it doesn't make sense that you're creating these large areas to have all these people together. You need to be dealing with the individual and finding out what him or her has as issues and then address that. And we know that there are various reasons why someone becomes homeless. So she was kind of dumbfounded on that. Um, but I said to her, I said, you're not going to be able to proceed there because we're going to terminate the ambulance service to that address uh, as of March 11th. We're going to give you two weeks to come up with your own ambulance service that is going to service just that location in East Farmingdale. And we're going to direct the department not to, and look, this is a major step for me to take because there's all sorts of questions about liability but i said i'm going to err on the side of caution and not put those volunteers we've already saw the one woman who was stabbed she lived in comac if you remember a couple months ago in the city she was in queens and some guy just came stabbed her. she was a long time employee of the fdny um, i mean they're in dangerous situations when they're dealing with particularly those who are addicted to drugs or alcohol. And look, again, they're not shrinking violence, but again, if we know about a situation, then we need to take steps to not put them in that dangerous situation. So she said, well, can you do that? I said, yeah, I can do that, because I'm gonna declare a state of emergency. I'm going to say that this has been a major issue for East Farmingdale. Residents are not getting the response they should, either if they're, if they're uh, living in East Farmingdale or they're working in East Farmingdale. Uh, and um, I'm going to tell you that you've got to have your own ambulance by midnight going into uh, Saturday, March 11th. You got two weeks to do it. Um, so we told them no South Bay and we told them you're not getting ambulance service to East Farmingdale. And you better figure out what you're doing because I want to go over to East Farmingdale and see what's going on behind that white fence. And you're not going to tell me, because again, what the county or the state usually roll out on us is that, well, we're above you, we don't have to listen to you. And the only way you get listened to is how? Make a lot of noise, right? And so I said, okay, if you don't want to let me come there, I'm going to make a lot of noise, and I'm going to make sure that you let me in there. And I'm going to bring Jerry Giganti, who's our Commissioner of Public Safety, the retired Chief of Detectives and First Precinct Inspector, who's got a lot of knowledge. I'm going to bring Chief Scott Lewis from the East Farmingdale Fire Department. I'm going to bring Chief Fire Marshal Anthony Cardali, and I'm going to bring a building inspector with me. And we're all going to go on a tour, and we're going to see the security that you've got and the services that you've got. And we're going to ask the question, why are all these people overdosing in this facility? And what is it that you've been doing to address it since it's been going on for three months, three and a half months? And show me the records that you have. Otherwise, I'm going to request the Attorney General come in here and conduct an investigation as to what you're doing. Because you're getting public tax dollars 
to provide this service. And when you get public tax dollars, you have an obligation to make sure that you're using them correctly. So if some operator like this organization is getting tax dollars and they're charged with the care of those individuals mm -hmm. under them and they're overdosing and they're dying and they're being hurt, well, there's a problem and the attorney general needs to look into it. So that got their attention when I told them those three things and I said, we're having this meeting Friday afternoon, so if you wanna come, you can come, but we're gonna let all the community know and we're gonna pass these resolutions and you're gonna have to deal with me and the town board for the next two weeks until you get your, excuse my bureaucratic term, shit together uh, and tell us what you're going to do here. One, you're not gonna go forward with South Bay and two, you're gonna come with an ambulance service and we gave them all the numbers, Northwell, Catholic Health, uh, uh, Stony Brook University Hospital, Hunter, all the various ambulances that our uh, fire services use in general here and we just recently used when we had an issue with the North Amityville Fire Department and not uh, being able to respond adequately it was affecting uh, surrounding departments like Copeg who had to respond to North Amityville to provide fire protection services we worked out a deal with Stony Brook University they have an ambulance on site and they respond very well so I said you can use that same model to help the East Farmingdale situation. And then I left them with this. How many of you know where Liberty Village is? Anybody heard of it? No. So Liberty Village is, you know where the North Amityville pool is on Albany and uh, New Highway? So it used to be the old federal Nike Air Force Base. And uh, years ago, Congressman, then Congressman Steve Israel, got that property transferred over to the town and the purposes of that property transfer were twofold. One was to provide additional park area for the pool and the park that we have over there. And the second was to create housing for homeless veterans. So Long Island on any one given night has about a thousand individuals of the homeless people who are US veterans. Excuse me. And they said, we want you to build supportive housing for homeless veterans. So. Liberty Village is um, a group by, run by a fellow by the name of Ralph Fasano. If you get a chance, take a go, a, a go over there and see. They have 60 individual units. They have all of the services that needed. So if, they, if the homeless vet was, uh, had drug or alcohol addiction issues, or if they had PTSD or uh, mental health issues, or, or just needed retraining, job retraining, or bringing him or her back into, uh, into the real world, they have that all on site. We have not had one issue, one issue from there. In fact, the North Amityville community embraced them when we located that facility there. They were all there for the groundbreaking and they go there once a year, they have a summer party that we all go over and meet the, res uh, meet the residents who live there. And the purpose of it is they can stay there up to three years and the goal is to get him or her back where they can go out on their own so that another homeless veteran could come in there. And I said, why can't you use that model for dealing with the population that you're dealing with? It pays respect to the population and it pays respect to the surrounding communities. And if you do it right and you're up front with people, they're gonna more likely than not be supportive of what you're doing. If you play games and you sneak around and you do all of that sort of thing, you're gonna get it exploded in your face and you're gonna to have to backtrack and figure out what to do with your responsibility. And this was the discussion we had. In fact, uh, Councilman McSweeney is here. That's Terry McSweeney who's been dealing with both of the issues. And in the back is our county legislator, the minority leader, J legislator Jason Richburg. Jason, come on up over here as well. Um, so we left them uh, on Wednesday with the fact that we were having this meeting, um, we were going to consider the two resolutions, and we gave them an earful. Well, of course, the commissioner is now my new best friend, <laughs> has called me 96 times since, since the, uh, oh, and also our presiding officer, uh, legislator Kevin McCaffrey is here as well. So Kevin and Jason, come on up here. So. Um, 
So the commissioner's been my new best friend, and um, I'm working on it, I'm getting an ambulance, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And of course, Kevin and Jason got to work right away because when they learned about this, and they didn't even know about this, uh, and they're two county legislators, they're two people who are two of 18 members who pass on the budget for social services, who are responsible for all these things. Those of you who are involved in PTA or school district know that when you're sitting on a board as a board member, you, know, you, know, you need to get information. And they had zero information about this until we tipped them off because of that call we got last Friday from into the fire marshal's office. So it's not the way that government is supposed to operate, number one, we know that. And two, again, I leave you with, if you're just up front with people and you talk to them about what the issues are, you can come to some conclusion about what we have to do. We, again, I know that everybody in this room is compassionate, cares, wants to do the right thing, but you don't wanna be lied to, you don't wanna be faked out, you don't wanna be told something that uh, all of a sudden you're gonna have to shoulder more of the burden than everybody else in Suffolk County. And look, Suffolk County is a big place, right? Yeah. There are nine other towns besides Babylon that could shoulder this part of the burden and you and we would not have to take in almost 60% of the individual uh, male population that exists at any one given time in Suffolk. Now, granted, it hasn't been as bad a winter as past winters, you would admit. So I know that issues that we usually have when we have cold nights and uh, we work closely with Our Lady of Assumption. They do Our Lady of Assumption, Miraculous Metal, Perpetual Help, uh, Our Lady of Grace all do during the uh, normal crazy cold winter months, they each take a night where they're housing those who need to come off the street. And we work with them, we help them, we've gotten them uh, beds and facilities and uh, funding necessary to do that because we know that the church can't absorb that burden on its own they're they're barely being able to make it for the services that they need to provide so so uh deacon mills and others who you know do a great job in, in doing that so that's the kind of logic we presented to the commissioner that's the logic that uh kevin and jason backed up and that's the logic that tony and terry and dwayne and it's funny dwayne's not here yet and he told me one of the earth he's hit every light he's hit every light <laughs> Could we all razz him when he comes in? <laughs> and uh, Anthony Minetta, who's our other town board member, and Jerry Capitello, you guys moved a wedding out. Uh, we're doing the wedding up in my office right now. So, so those are the things that we're going to do today. So county law says that the Commissioner of Social Services has to send a letter to each town supervisor and the county legislators about what locations exist in their town or their district. So, shame on me, they sent a letter in November, but they sent it by snail mail. So when the letters come in here, the letter came in, I said, why don't you email? We only know if they're sex offenders if we check the registry. So we have someone who checks the registry regularly, and we can identify for you where every sex offender is located, meaning they could be in a home, right? Mm -hmm. So, and you know that there's notifications that go out. Mm -hmm. They end up with some homeless sex offenders. Mm -hmm. And what, what Dwayne said about that, and this was an issue that came before the county legislature, that um, he felt there were ways that they were trying to get around the requirement that if they moved somebody within seven days, I believe, that it wouldn't have to be reported. Because you know in the registry, if you change your address, like we have a case going on right now with um, an individual in Deer Park who plays that game. He keeps moving from apartment to apartment. So he, he's kind of smart to the fact that the notification doesn't have to go out if he keeps moving. So he says he's transient, but we know based on just past history with him of what the game he's playing. So that's something that we're gonna to talk to our state representatives about. Uh, to see if we can close that loophole. Bill? Where would our homeless people come from? Where would our sex offenders be sent from? Meaning, if, Meaning where they come from, where, if, where they live now. Right, so that was the question we asked on there. We said of the 204, how many of them 
had a last address in the town of Babylon. Because if you tell me that, you know, 30 of them have a last address, you know, it's almost like we're going to take care of our people. But we can't take care of everybody's people. Every town needs to kick in and assist. So I don't want people from Southampton uh, being shipped over here or people from Southhold. Why should Babylon have to adopt? Again, I'm, and I've known a lot of you a long time. I'm not an ogre. I'm not, you know, we don't have a mean, but oh, it's ah, three o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> All your peeps are here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just explaining what's going on before we have the actual meeting. But, but yes, Bill, you're right on target with which is what we said. We said we don't mind shouldering our burden. We don't, we're not in a position to shoulder everybody's burden. One follow-up question. Yep. Okay, so theoretically, if a homeless person was sent to, end to South Bay Motel, once you establish residency there, then he would be registered as a sex offender. So in the meantime, you don't know he's a sex offender no. on his way there. Jason, that's, that's amazing. No, you, if, if you were a, if you are a registered sex offender, that means it was a it was a criminal act that you were arrested for, you were prosecuted for. So you, you would be registered before that. You you wouldn't have to, your, your resident, you wouldn't have to You, have to, the you notification have to report your is, change of residence. The notification is different. If you were already you know, registered with the state as a sex offender, that's one thing. So you have your designation once your criminal case is adjudicated. But what Dwayne was pointing out is that for the change of address. So. Once you locate someplace, you have to notify New York State through uh, the criminal justice um, portal, but you don't have to do that until seven days. So if you move, quote unquote, every seven days, then you never can find them. So I'll tell you a little secret and don't tell anybody. Carolyn, turn that off. No, like, um, we just brought in a special detective who retired from the New York City Police Department, who actually lives in our town, and we are retaining his services to monitor all of the sex offenders. This isn't just homeless sex offenders, but we're monitoring it because he learned in New York City that of the games that can be played to not keep up with where people are. And uh, he's a pretty smart guy. He, like I said, he just retired from the New York City. He was a detective that handled sex crimes and sex offenders. So he did a survey for us and he pointed out where in the um, portal and in the um, uh, uh, listings where they can play games. And so we said, that's a great assignment to hire somebody for, to make sure that we have all the accurate information that we need we can work with the school districts, whether it be Copeg or Lindenhurst uh, or any of the others and make that information available so that they don't have to worry or they don't have to spend money on trying to track that, that I believe and the town board believes that that should be an obligation of us, that public safety falls under our domain and we work closely with the Suffolk Police Department and we wanna make sure that we stay on top of it. So. We're going to be doing that. Supervisor Rich Schaefer and, and the town board members are breaking the news. This is something of concern to each and every one of us. And I think that uh, Rich laid it out perfectly to say, hey, we understand there's a problem out there. And maybe we, we need to find a place for people that are homeless and, and transient. And I think one sometimes you, you find a good location, sometimes you don't. But either way, the town of Babylon should not be shouldering the responsibility for almost every one of the single homeless males here in, in Suffolk County. It's, it's a big county, 1.5 million people, and it's a long way out to Montauk. And uh, we think that there's enough to spread around for everybody to do their part. It's not fair that we have 77 or almost 100 already on, on East Farmingdale. And we got good news for the East Farmingdale uh, uh, Fire Department as well. Uh, but it's, it's not fair. And to put them in an area right by the South Bay uh, Motel there on Montauk Highway is not a good location. Why do you so we, we, uh, I'm sorry, just let me just continue then we'll answer some questions. So uh, Jason and I reached out uh, to the county executive 
uh, when we knew there was a, a meeting going on, it brought it to a head. I called him, Jason called him, and said, you need to fix this. And to his credit, within an hour, I received back, and I think I just received a letter. You may have just got emailed to you. Didn't come snail mail, I emailed it to you. <laughs> and, uh, and it's uh, saying from his office, saying that uh, DSS will not be entering into a contract with the South Bay Marina to provide them. <laughs> I do not, but East Farmingdale, they've already contracted, I believe it was with Hunter Ambulance Co Company for the East Farmingdale location, so I know Yay. Chief Lewis will be as happy. So, I know, I'm so this is a good example of government working together, you know, people coming together and saying, hey, we have a concern here, and that's what your, your role is, because we listen to you, especially when you have a, a group of uh, people that come out and say we're concerned about it. And you should be concerned about it because it's unfair what's happening. Well, that, we, that could we told be... the county executive we're going to send you all to his house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to go visit. And so, by the way, Brenda no Reyes way. is here representing our assemblywoman, uh, Kimberly Jean-Pierre, as well. Thank you, Brenda. And she's a co paid graduate. And so this is a, I mean, this is the village level as well. Mayor Michael Everardo called me at 10.30 last night saying we've got to fix this. Uh, I know uh, May, Mayor Siri is, was involved in this, and uh, we just want to make it equitable and fair, and it was not. And uh, I'm glad we were able to all come together and, and find a solution to this. And But this is not going, not going to be going forward. That, that proposal is done, and we're going to provide the relief uh, that the East Farmingdale Fire Department needs. And because if they're providing, putting that burden on our community, they should be the ones that, that are, are, are fixing that problem. So, uh, Bill, my question is, who 